So far in this tutorial, we've explored the basics of groups and representations, and we've gone over the four requirements for something to compose a group. Then we looked at some applications of groups in the form of rotation groups acting on different coordinate systems. And we explored different representations of these rotation groups in both two dimensions and three dimensions. Finally, we identified a very important group in physics called SO3 and nailed down the requirements for that group as well. In this lesson, we're going to look at a new representation for when things get a little bit more complicated than matrices. To create this new representation, we'll have to use something called index notation. For our first example, let's look at our 2D rotation matrix from the last lesson, and we'll begin to rewrite it using index notation. Instead of having sines and cosines, we'll replace each element of the rotation matrix with the letter R and two indices. The upper index tells us which row the element belongs in. In other words, an upper index of 1 tells us the element belongs in row 1, and an upper index of 2 tells us the element belongs in row 2. Likewise, the lower index tells us which column the element belongs in. This way, an element labeled R1'1 prime belongs in row 1, column 1, and an element labeled R2'1 prime belongs in row 2, column 1, and so on. The upper index is primed because it represents a transformation from one coordinate system, or what we call the unprimed coordinate system, to another primed coordinate system. We can do the same thing with vectors as well. For a column vector, everything is already in column 1, so the lower index isn't particularly useful. We'll represent each element of the vector by the letter V with one upper index. This way, the first element of the vector is labeled v1, the second is labeled v2, and so on for any vector of arbitrary length. When I multiply this matrix and this vector together, we should get some resulting vector with two elements as well. Just using matrix multiplication, we find that the first element should be equal to r1 prime 1 times v1 plus r1 prime 2 times v2. Similarly, the second element should equal r2 prime 1 times v1 plus r2 prime 2 times v2. We'll call the first element of the new vector v1 prime and the second element v2 prime to represent the elements of the vector in the new or the primed coordinate system. This seems a little pointless at first. Why can't we just write out the matrices with their original elements? There are two reasons we like to use index notation. First, we'll find that as physics gets more complicated, not everything can be represented as a matrix, and index notation will be the only way to perform these computations. Second, matrices can get very big very fast, and we don't always want to write out every single element, let alone perform increasingly complicated matrix multiplications. One way we can easily represent a rotation matrix of any size is with the representation r mu prime mu. Again, the prime index represents the new coordinate system and the unprimed index represents the old coordinate system. Typically, we like to keep representations in terms of either all primed or all unprimed coordinates. Transformations, however, are the exception to this rule as they represent the operation that moves us between the primed and unprimed systems. Similarly, a vector of any size can be represented by v mu. Here, the indices mu prime and mu contain all the allowed values for both rows and columns. So, for example, if a matrix contained six rows, mu prime would include the numbers 1 through 6. And if that matrix had four columns, mu would include the numbers 1 through 4. We still want to find that new or primed vector that results from the multiplication of this matrix and this vector. We write this by saying v mu, or the vector in the old coordinate system, transforms to v mu prime, or the vector in the new coordinate system, by the rule v mu prime equals r mu prime mu times v mu. Again, v mu represents the original vector, v mu prime represents the vector in the new coordinate system, and r mu prime mu represents the transformation operation that gets us from the old coordinate system into the new coordinate system.
Just like with any representation, we still need a rule for combining different elements. Here, we see that R has a lower index mu and V has an upper index mu. When we see a repeated index like this one, where one is lower and one is upper, we contract or sum over all the allowed values for that index. The act of summing in this manner was first created by Einstein. So we call this notation Einstein summation convention. So let's go back to the two by two example, where mu just includes the numbers one and two. Again, keep in mind that we're summing over all of the allowed values for mu. So this means that v mu prime now becomes r mu prime one v one plus r mu prime two v two. And I know that the vector v mu prime has mu prime number of elements. So in this two by two example, mu prime also contains two allowed values, one and two. So we can plug in both one and two for mu prime to find the two elements of the new vector. So v1 prime equals r1 prime 1 v1 plus r1 prime 2 v2 and v2 prime equals r2 prime 1 v1 plus r2 prime 2 v2. If we look back at the matrix multiplication we did on the first slide, you may notice that this is the exact same result we found before. In the first method, we use matrix multiplication, and in this method, we use index notation. Both got us the exact same answer. As a side note, when using this kind of representation, the index mu is referred to as a contracted index. Because it appears as both an upper and a lower index, we cannot just choose one value for mu. Instead, we must sum over all the values for mu. On the other hand, mu prime is what we call a free index. We can choose just one value for mu prime, plug that value in, and find an expression for an individual component. Let's take a quick break and do a few exercises. Here I've written out a 3x3 three three rotation matrix with elements A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H, I, and a three component vector with components 1, 2, and 3. Using index notation and not matrix multiplication, I want you to find the following. First, R2 prime 3, V3. Second, R2 prime mu, V mu. And third, V mu, R2 prime mu. Let's go over the solutions. Here, I've explicitly listed each element of the rotation matrix with indices representing their respective rows and columns. I've also listed each element of the vector with its respective index as well. Part A asks for R2 prime 3 V3. All we have to do for this one is look at the lists above and find which elements each representation corresponds to. Looks like R2 prime 3 is F and V3 is 3. So that means R2 prime 3 V3 equals 3F. And that's our answer to part A. Part B asks us to find R2 prime mu V mu. Here, mu is a contracted index, which means we must sum over all its allowed values. Since we have a 3 by 3 matrix, mu can be 1, 2, or 3. When we sum over mu, the result is R2 prime 1 V1 plus R2 prime 2 V2 plus R2 prime 3 V3. Again, we can look at the list above and plug in some values. Our final answer tells us that R2 prime mu V mu equals D plus 2E plus 3F. Notice that this result is consistent with what we would get if we used matrix multiplication. The 2 in R2 prime mu tells us we want the second element of the resulting vector, which linear algebra tells us is equal to D plus 2E plus 3F. So far, the math is looking good. Part C asks for V mu R2 prime mu. This looks very similar to part B, but the order has been switched around a bit. However, mu still appears to be a contracted index, and we can sum over all the values of mu just as we did before. 
when we start plugging in values from the list above, it turns out we actually get the same answer as we did in Part B. This is one benefit of using index notation. If we were told to solve this using matrix multiplication, we wouldn't be able to do it. Multiplying a column vector by a matrix isn't possible under the rules of linear algebra. Using index notation, however, we find that order doesn't matter. Now that we're a little more comfortable with index notation operations, let's do something a little harder. Here, we have a 2x2 two two transformation matrix and a matrix representation with two upper indices, which we write as t mu nu. For this exercise, I want you to find the components of this representation in the transformed coordinate system. In other words, we're looking for t mu prime nu prime. Here's a hint to get you started. In order to transform both indices, we'll need to apply the transformation twice, once for mu and once for nu. We'll end up with two contracted indices, mu and nu. Our equation should look like t mu prime nu prime equals r mu prime mu times r nu prime nu times t mu nu. Start by summing over nu first and then mu. Let's take a look at how this calculation plays out. Once again, I've explicitly listed the index notation representation of each element above, so we can easily plug them in later. I'll start by summing over the values for nu. Since this is a 2 by 2 representation, that includes just 1 and 2. The first summation results in something like this. Next, we'll sum over the allowed values for mu, again just 1 and 2. The result after this contraction now looks like this. Now all we have left are free indices. This means we can start plugging in numbers to find components. To find t 1 prime 1 prime, I'll plug in the number 1 for both mu prime and nu prime, giving me this result. Finally, all our indices have actual number values, so we can start plugging in the values for above. This gives us the simplest form of t 1 prime 1 prime. a squared plus 5ab plus 4b squared. And there's our first element. We can use a nearly identical procedure to find the other three components. I won't write them all out explicitly, but you should have gotten the following answers. Finally, we can write the representation in the transformed coordinate system as follows. One last note on this example before we wrap this section up. If we were to naively plug matrices into the equation I gave you originally, we may end up with this setup. And performing the matrix multiplication yields the following. Notice that this is not the answer we found when we first use index notation. In the previous example, we said that order doesn't matter when we use index notation. However, when we try to use matrices, order does matter. In matrix form, the contracted indices must be adjacent to one another. To get our equation into this form, we have to rearrange the representations to look like this. Performing this multiplication, now we get back the same answer as when we used index notation.
so yeah, it is possible to do this with matrices, but the original setup is far from intuitive and leaves lots of room for mistakes. Just one more reason why index notation proves to be much more reliable as the physics gets more complicated.